Amen. Okay. So let's go to Matthew 21. <clears throat> so with this uh, being Palm Sunday week, we're going to tour. We're going to Jerusalem. They really excited you. She just went, whoa, it threw her water up in the air. Like the palm branch, it's throwing water. <laughs> so uh, we're going to Jerusalem. We're going to tour the Palm Sunday Road. We're going to look at some of the events uh, that took place uh, on Palm Sunday. And, and this is a powerful lesson. There's some powerful events that took place. And as I was reading this, normally when we think of Palm Sunday, we just think of the celebration, the palms. And there's a lot of meaning behind that. Uh, it's more than just, yay, celebration. It, there's, a, there's a challenge. There is a challenge. And I've got three specific points from, uh, from that day uh, that's a challenge to us as we prepare for Holy Week, as we prepare for uh, Good Friday and then Easter. But Matthew 21, <clears throat> so let me say this, all four Gospels, have a, a little bit different a take. They're, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they're, you know, they're writing from their own viewpoint. Matthew and John were present with Jesus. So they're right, this is firsthand experience for Matthew and John. Mark and Luke are writing what they've heard from others. So you get a good uh, perspective. But Matthew 21, I'm going to look at Matthew and then I'll look at Luke a little bit too. So it says, as Jesus, Matthew 21, 1, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter, you will see a donkey tied there with its coat beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord uh, needs them and he will immediately let you take them. So the backdrop of this story Jesus has just come from Jericho. He's walked from Jericho. Jericho's in the Judean uh, desert, the Judean wilderness. Jericho, that's when he, he healed uh, Zacchaeus. All of that took place in Jericho. So he walked through the desert, through the wilderness, 34 miles, and he comes to the top of the Mount of Olives. So basically, the backside of the Mount of Olives butts up to the Judean wilderness. Uh, you've heard of Bethany. Uh, Mary and uh, Martha and Lazarus. He visited. He visited them. They, they uh, Bethany is basically on the opposite side of the Mount of Olives as well. So um, here he asked for a coat. So he's walking all this distance, but now he only has a mile to go into Jerusalem. But he asked for a coat, and and of course this is deliberate because there's meaning behind the coat. Why he chose the donkey, and the Jews would understand this. So verse 4 says, this took place to fulfill the prophecy. So he's fulfilling prophecy. That's why he did it. It's not like he was tired. It's not like he needed a, a, you know, a lift. No, he did it to fulfill prophecy. He says, verse 5, tell the, people of, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. This is from Zechariah. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt, verse 7, uh, to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So the first picture I'll show you is a picture of the Palm Sunday Road, the road that Jesus, the pathway that Jesus uh, uh, rode on the donkey. So you can see over here is Jerusalem. It's a steep mountain. I got some more pictures, but it's a steep winding road that, that uh, goes down the mountain. Um, let's see. I think I got another picture of that little road, too. Gives you kind of a perspective, the, the crowds. Uh, a little FYI, all this to the <laughs> left over here, it seems like it's thousands of graves. Graves, graves, <laughs> graves, graves, graves. That, if you're, if you're a Jew... That's where you want to be buried, because uh, just like Christians, they believe that their Messiah is going to come and touch down on the Mount of Olives, walk across the Kidron Valley, go through the Eastern Gate. I'll show you that in a second. So they want to be there, uh, feet 
to the eastern gate. So when the Messiah comes, they'll rise up from the grave and walk on in. They're right. That's right. So that is the most valued property uh, in all the world for a Jew is to be buried on the Mount of Olives. Millions of dollars if you if you'd like to buy a, would you like to buy a grave at the, okay. <laughs> Do you think the walls there are original or? Okay, those walls, matter of fact, I'll show you a better picture in just a second. Those walls were built by the Crusaders. Well, like this part, about about there is part of, a, is like original. So they okay. built on top of, I mean, the city of Jerusalem has been burned down so many times, uh, you know, and it's built up. But the bottom are the actual walls. But this part was built by the create by the Crusaders, um, twelve to fifteen hundred like AD. The walls along the walkway that we're looking at, it, those are fairly. Yeah, those are going to be. I, I don't know how old, you know, but those are going to be, not two thousand years old. No, but it's the same general picture, and uh, path. Uh, that is believed, and I'll show you um, an actual another important spot too. So it says, kind of narrow, isn't it? It's very narrow. Yeah, yeah. it's very narrow. Mm-hmm. And steep, okay. narrow and steep. Yeah. And so that's always fun to um, to walk down that road. We'll walk down the road. Keith and Michelle will walk down. Mm-hmm. At the bottom is uh, Gethsemane. You walk. So when Jesus, when he uh, rode his donkey, he passed by Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane, and he crossed the Kidron Valley. A lot, a lot of uh, took place in the Kidron Valley. That's that's all this right in here, which is also called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. You heard of Psalms twenty three? There's always a constant shadow over that valley. Uh, there's a message in itself how Jesus, the night when he was crucified, he crossed through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> so, I mean, think about Jesus went through the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death, so that we don't have to face death. And so there's just so much significance. Um, Absalom, that's where Absalom was killed, where he was hung, and then when Absalom was running and or on the horse. and yeah. So, anyways, got a lot of Jerusalem stuff. We can show you a lot of different things with Jerusalem. But uh, verse 9 says, Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. That's New Living Translation. Uh, John, of course, says, his version says, Hosanna, which means God save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the only time in Jesus' ministry that he permitted the crowds to celebrate him. Normally, he's when they get a little too celebratory he he sneaks away and he even tells people don't tell you know after don't tell them what i did for you but he allowed this celebration he allowed this praise because of he knew the time was near and of course he was doing it to fulfill the scripture the prophecy of zechariah 9 9 zechariah 9 9 uh prophesies this day rejoice O people of zion shout in triumph O people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's coat. So it's interesting. This isn't random that he's riding on a donkey's coat. Um, the, the significance of him riding on the donkey's coat, um, that represents his humility, yet he is Humble, Zechariah 9, 9, uh, 9, 9 says. You would, if you were in the crowd, you would be thinking probably that the king would be coming in on this majestic horse, right? A warring horse. But no, he comes in on a lowly coat. Now, I found something really interesting. I really never really looked at this closely until this week. Each gospel has a different perspective to this story. Uh, most just... Bo- uh, Mark, Luke, John just speak of him riding on a colt. But Matthew, I found it interesting. Matthew speaks of a donkey and its colt. Matthew brings up the mother and the colt. So I've, all, you know, normally, that's why I always learn something new. I, I mean, I've probably seen this before, but it, I never really paid attention. Uh, it, was, it wasn't just a colt by itself. It was a colt with the mother walking beside it. 
And so verse 4 again says, as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt. So the mother and this untamed colt, untie them and bring them to me. Mark 11, 2 uh, mentions that this colt has never been ridden. So this colt is, is untamed. It's young, so much so that it needs his mother to walk beside it, to bring it comfort, to bring it assurance as Jesus wrote it. And to me, um, this, this just further displays the humility of Jesus, the meekness of Jesus, the mildness, that, that he is so peaceful that even this untamed little colt that has to have its mother allows Jesus to get on it and ride it peacefully. I don't know what it's like uh, if you've maybe some horsemen in here, some cowboys in here. Is it usually nice and peaceful when you're trying? <laughs> okay. <laughs> It'd probably be bucking and all that, right? <laughs> but doesn't this, to me, that verse really stands out that, wow, this is, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, right? That even this little donkey recognized Jesus as the Prince of Peace. So it's amazing to me. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the, the King of Peace. And the donkeys recognize, recognize him. So the King of Peace, and this is what's interesting, is riding on an untamed colt with the mother. He's riding in Jerusalem. Do you know what the, the name Jerusalem means? City of Peace. Salem, the Hebrew for Salem is Shalom. Jeru Shalom, peace. So uh, it's the city of peace. And uh, you read in Genesis and even Hebrews about Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, king of Salem, king of Shalom, king of peace. And so uh, I always break my studies down into little points. So my first point is the king of peace humbly enters into the city of peace. Humbly enters the city of peace. Jerusalem, peace. Don't you think Jesus is trying to send a message that he is bringing peace? He is the, the giver of peace. He's bringing peace. He's the source of peace. And so they gave them, as we read, a great welcome. And we'll, we'll see shortly that even though they celebrated and waved their palm branches, they really didn't understand what all this was about. They didn't understand that Jesus really is the Prince of Peace. See, they were mainly looking for their king and savior to be like a political hero, to save them from the Romans, <laughs> to save them from Roman oppression, to bring physical peace. They didn't recognize that no, Jesus is there to bring spiritual peace, peace in the heart. So they missed it. And of course, these Pharisees, it triggered them. <laughs> they were triggered um, uh, by all of everything the crowd was doing. Go over to Luke 19, 39. So we'll finish up in Luke 19, 19, 39. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. I mean, in other, tell, keep quiet. Keep quiet. This is blasphemy. This is blasphemy. They're not supposed to praise this human. And also, I probably would bet that they probably want to keep the crowds tame so the Roman soldiers don't c come and, you know, jump, come and insert themselves into the matter. Because really, in those days, the king was Caesar. <laughs> the king was Caesar to the Romans. But Jesus, notice what Jesus says in verse 40. He says, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. The New King James Version say the stones will cry out. You've heard, you've heard that phrase, the stones will cry out. Now, uh, scholars believe that that phrase, the stones cry out, has a twofold meaning. The first meaning... <laughs> Basically, Jesus is God. You're not going to stop his praise. <laughs> the stones will cry out. You know, they, they, they'll praise the Lord. And his praise can't be thwarted. That's, and that's a typical, that's what most people believe. Uh, but there's another meaning that uh, scholars believe as well when Jesus said the stones will cry out. And if the first, me, the first meaning is about praise, the stones will praise. But the second meaning is the stones will cry out in judgment. In judgment. 
And actually, this goes back to Habakkuk 2.11, a prophecy from Habakkuk 2.11, which says, the stones of the wall will cry out. So what's that referring to? It's referring to the Babylonian uh, destruction, the Babylonians coming in in 586 B.C. And, and why did God allow the Babylonians to come and destroy Jerusalem? Because of rebellion, because of sin. So Habakkuk was delivering this word of this prophecy of judgment. The stones are going to cry out. The stone, after the Babylonians destroy the city, destroy the walls, destroy the temple, the, the stones, the rubble is going to cry out and testify about the judgment of God and testify. And basically, the stones are basically going to say, you did this to yourself. <laughs> so that's what the stones are saying. And so uh, these fallen rocks in this instance would, would, are crying out in judgment. And so we're actually going to see in just a moment, I'll show you, that just as Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians, Jerusalem would be destroyed again just a few years after this by the Romans in 70 A.D., and so some scholars, say, me included, believe that this is also a prophecy, a prophecy of judgment on Jerusalem, which will come to pass in 70 AD. So in considering all of this, I mean, consider all the celebration. You know, the, the crowds are celebrating, but they don't really know what they're celebrating. But Jesus is mourning. He's mourning. He's in sorrow because he see, this, the crowd doesn't get it. And look at verse 41. But as he came closer to Jerusalem, and he's considering all of this, the destruction that's coming, he saw the city ahead. He began to weep. Only two times he wept. Here and Lazarus. That's right. And he says in verse 42, How I wish today that you, that you of all people would understand the way to peace. Peace He's the king of peace, going into Jerusalem, the city of peace, riding on a donkey, coming in peace. But he's like, you of all people should understand the, the way of peace, but now it is too late. Peace is hidden from your eyes. They, they can't see. Remember, they're, they're looking for peace from the Romans. They're looking for political peace. They're looking for physical peace. And the king of peace is right there. They're missing it. They're missing true peace. True spiritual peace. It's hidden from their eyes. Uh, my second point would be the king of peace weeps over Jerusalem. I mean, that's a sad, that's a sad picture, isn't it? A sad scene. Uh, he came to his own and his own received him not. Uh, put up the next picture. This is the picture of the spot. Let's see. Do you have it? There you go. So that's a picture. This is like a ridge right here, and that's to be to be believed, however you say it. I, don't, I can't even talk tonight. Where he stopped and where he looked at Jerusalem and where he wept. So imagine being Jesus on his colt, this ridge, and just looking. It's a clear picture and just looking at the city, and oh, they don't understand. They don't understand. Today, there's a church. Remember how in the Holy Land, we, we could get a pretty good idea of the spots, the sites, the holy sites based on churches that are built. There's a church that's built there called Dominus Flevit. That's Latin for the Lord wept. And put up that next picture. And this church was built over the remains of a 6th century church. Very interesting church. It's a dome, dome-shaped church. And Linda, you'll like this since you like the architecture and the history. So um, you can look this up. If you want to look, see more pictures of your own, it's called Dominus Flevit. You can, there's pictures all over uh, the website. But there's one lone eye. It's like an eye right here. And that eye is facing Jerusalem. So it's like a picture of the eye of Jesus that's looking over Jerusalem. And another thing that's interesting, you see this green that's like stained rain. And the way the roof is built, it's like the, the rain just dribbles down and, they, and the rain collects in these pots. And so it resembles tears, like tears. And so the picture is of Jesus crying and weeping. And the pots 
uh, is a reminder of how God, um, he has pots and psalms where he collects our tears in bottles, you know, so he's weeping. So yeah, it's uh, pretty powerful, pretty powerful. Go back to that other picture. All right, so let's look at some sites here in Jerusalem. Let's see what we got here. The gold dome. The gold dome, that's called the Dome of the Rock. That's actually the Temple Mount. That's Temple Mount. Um, that's where the temple stood. That is Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. Do you remember what took place on Mount Moriah in Genesis? It's called the Dome of the Rock. <laughs> what do you think? Yes. That dome is built around a rock that's believed to be the rock where Isaac, where he laid Isaac. So that is Mount Moriah. So the temple, like you hear Zion, Mount Zion. Uh, Mount Zion's a little bit over this way, but the temple is Mount Moriah. The temple was built on the, in, on the mount where Abraham offered Isaac. And so uh, it, it's sad today uh, the Muslims have, that's a, that's a Muslim, that's a mosque. Yeah, so the Muslims have taken over, and they have, it, you talk, it's criminal. It's criminal what they have done, how they have tried to wash away Jewish history. The Temple Mount, God put that there, and yet it's a shame, really, Jews really, they can go up there certain times of the day, but they don't really have free access to go up there to their own place of worship. Uh, so it's very sad. Um, okay, this wall, the wall that was built by the Crusaders, this is the eastern wall. And let's see, right here is a closed-in gate. You, can, you, may, you might have to look it up for yourself. It's a closed-in gate, and that's the Golden Gate or the Eastern Gate. And it's closed up, and the reason it's closed in is because of uh, that's, that's the gate where the Messiah is going to go through. He's going to come, Jesus, when he returns to earth, he's going to come right back down the Mount of Olives, and he's going to go through the eastern gate. So uh, they, they shut it. The, the Muslims basically closed it to try to keep the Messiah from entering, thinking that that's going to keep the Messiah out. Uh, but very interesting. On the, uh, let's see, on the southern side, wish I had a picture showing. The, I'll show it in just a second. On this side is uh, the, the southern wall, the southern steps. Mm -hmm. And the southern steps, those are the steps that all the pilgrims would come up to Jerusalem. And they'd walk up the steps and they would enter up into the temple complex. And from here, Jesus is going to go to the southern steps. I'll show you a picture of the southern steps in just a moment. Okay. Now, is that area by the gold dome, you said that's, that, facility, that building is controlled by the Muslims? It's, the it's a area. mosque, pretty much. So you can't go up in there? You can. Visit. We can go up in there certain times of the day. Uh, you've got to, it's, everything's got to be just perfect. Just, I have never been up there. Mm -hmm. I want to go up there. It's only like a certain, like you have like an hour to go up there, and I've always missed it, but... Um, yeah, it, it's available to go up there, uh, to go up. So in this picture here, are you looking east, or are you looking to the west? We're looking to the east. To the east. Okay. The Mount of Olives is on the west side. The Mount of Olives. So this is Mount of Olives looking, looking to Jerusalem, yeah. Uh, wait, no, 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 no. We're looking. With, okay. Yeah, because it's east, east, it's on the east side of Jerusalem. So this is the east side. So oh. Jerusalem is west of the Mount of Olives. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> There's yeah. no mountains there, so we you, well, I was I was getting ready to say that's <laughs> I I I had yeah, I can't even figure out where the mountains are. <laughs> but it's east gate, east east side of Jerusalem. Yeah, you keep going this way, you're gonna go into the Mediterranean. But yeah, Mount of Olives looking at the Eastern Gate. So Southern, Northern, West Side. Uh, so, I mean, just think about the whole picture. The, the King of Peace 
uh, Jesus. Jerusalem is the city of peace. Jerusalem. But the people of the city didn't recognize the one who would bring them true peace. He's weeping. They're looking for political peace. Peace from war. Peace from conflict. So they didn't recognize that Jesus was the one who was there to bring them all the peace they needed. Uh, Warren Wearsby, one of my go-to commentators that I love to study, uh, he wrote uh, a great observation. He said, no matter where Jesus looked, he found cause for weeping. If he looked back, he saw how the nation had wasted its opportunities and been ignorant of their time of visit visitation. If he looked within, he saw their spiritual ignorance and blindness in the hearts of the people. If he looked around, he saw religious activity that accomplished very little. The religious leaders were out to kill him. The city was filled with pilgrims celebrating a festival, but the hearts of the people were heavy with sin and life's burdens. And then as Jesus looked ahead, I'm still reading what he wrote, he wept as he saw the terrible judgment that was coming to the nation, the city, and the temple uh, from the Romans. See, God, God often used Israel's enemies to bring judgment, and, uh, which is Habakkuk. You know, Habakkuk's questioning, like, why are you allowing the people you hate to bring judgment? That's not right, you know. Verse 43, Jesus says, Before long your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place. The rocks are going to cry out. The rocks are going to cry out of judgment. A single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Wow. In 70 AD, this was fulfilled. The Romans sieged the city. They killed 600,000 Jews. They took more captive, more uh, thousands more captive, which led to the diaspora, the dispersion from 70 AD until 1948. For 1900 years, the Jews were scattered all around the world. And then, of course, 1948, Israel became a nation and started welcoming the Jews back. But that Romans, uh, or Romans, uh, A.D. 70, uh, the Romans, they, they caused the diaspora. And then they burnt the city. They burnt Jerusalem. They tore down the walls and they destroyed the temple. And so here's a picture of the destruction, the rubble. Put up the next picture. That dates back rubble still there beside the uh this would be beside the western wall beside the western wall uh yeah actually this wall here is on the opposite side is the wailing wall where the jews where the jews pray well where anybody goes and pray if you when you go to jerusalem you can pray at the wailing wall but these stones this is ground level from two thousand years ago these are the rocks that are crying out so the rocks, and they're still there. So you can see those rocks that are still there as a reminder of the devastation. Uh, I got another picture, southwest, southwest corner. Is it coming up a little slow? Okay. So this stone, southwest cornerstone, and uh, this is the stone at the... This would actually be the place that on the high festival days, a priest would come out and blow the shofar, you know, to open up the feast. But this stone had fallen, one of the stones that had fallen. So this is another stone that is crying out of the devastation that was caused by the Romans. And to think that, you know, this could have been avoided. This is because of rebellion. They, they failed to see, to see the king of peace, the prince of peace. So Jesus, he's weeping over this. Their failure to, to see him. He's weeping over the destruction, the destruction that's that's caused. Look, I got a video. Y'all are going to, a powerful, powerful video about the destruction of the Romans. And uh, I took, uh, when we go to Jerusalem, we've got friends at the city of David. And if you want to look at another interesting study of Israel, uh, look up or YouTube the city of David and look at all these amazing archaeological finds. A lot of, some of it's open to the public, some of it is not open to the public. 
Fortunately, we're able to go to the part that's not open to the public. They're the pilgrims, the pilgrims road from the pool of Siloam all the way up to the southern steps. We're able to go. We'll go to the pilgrims road, and this is a video from the pilgrims road that I think that I think you'll really enjoy of uh, one of the guides uh, that was showing us. And and literally, we were. This is a day after. A day after they have found an amazing discovery. So this is like the first video of this discovery. So check this out. Above the shops, wooden beams. And if Josephus writes that they did not leave a stone upon a stone and they burned the entire lower city to the ground until the fall of Siloam. He's talking about the Roman destruction. You see wooden beams burnt and everything would have collapsed mm -hmm. in and outside. That's how we find the shops and the road, and here is where the archaeologists got to yesterday. Oh. What you're seeing here, the rubble of rocks you're seeing, is look at this 90 degree angled stone. This is the former stone. Look at the chisel marks. Mm -hmm. This is from 2,000 years ago that belonged to what? To the house above my head. And once you burn the wooden beams, everything collapses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I emphasize this to show you the most amazing things that you might see in documentaries and saying, wow, that is so strong, but it's still a documentary, and it's still just a video, but imagine coming here, seeing this live, day after day, I take out of the soil found over here, it's everywhere. What are these? What is this? Look. This is charcoal, dated 1,951 years ago. This is Jerusalem destroyed 70 AD by the Roman Empire. Oh, wow. When one reads it, one can try and imagine it. One can try and relate to what had occurred over here on a personal manner. As an Israeli, as a Jew, as a Zionist, my ancestors were exiled out of Judea, out of this land, in the year 70 AD. And during exile, in diaspora, whether it was in Spain, during the Spanish Inquisition, whether it was in Hungary, Germany, Poland, Algeria, Morocco, Asia, Europe, America, yes, ma'am. The compass, my nation, my ancestors held throughout the year, throughout the days, was always directing towards Jerusalem. There was never any other direction. The prayer was to come back to Zion next year in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. That dream, that prayer, mm. is so profound. People don't understand where we come from. This is not just another place for us. This is not just a sanctuary. This is essence of our being. Jerusalem is essence of our being. So coming back over here in 1948, declaring an independent state when Jerusalem, where Jerusalem is, is its capital. When your president two and a half years ago moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, do you understand how important that event was? That was recognition mm -hmm. that Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish state and my nation has come back. Mm -hmm. That is our exodus from all the world back home mm -hmm. to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. This could not have happened without the help of you, my friends, who have been backing us ever since the days of President Harry Truman, who voted in the United Nations and brought along with him other nations who have voted for the revitalization of Israel. We can't thank you enough for supporting us, for being behind us. And this is why we're here today, to say thank you and to bless you and to welcome you back home. This is home. Whether we like it or not, if it's not your first home, it's your second home. Right. This is where it all happens. That's right. Well, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. According to the prophecies, yes. Wow. And we can see how mm -hmm. they tend to uh, come true. Mm -hmm. So on this mark, I want to thank you again and bless you. 
and to show you that this is not a matter of faith alone, this is also a matter of fact. Yeah. And with this note, as ambassadors, I'd like you to continue your mission mm -hmm. and uh, continue with your friendship with us. Thank you. Yeah. Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. Powerful stuff. Yep. Not just faith alone, but fact. See, this is what people are trying to cover up. This happened. This happened. The the Jewish people uh, are the most oppressed people in history. Period. The most oppressed people in history. What you see on the news, and unfortunately, people don't understand that what is happening over there, they're still blaming the Jews because of the propaganda that they're getting on the news. It's propaganda. It's lies. The Jews are not harming the people of Gaza. They're the, the IDF soldiers are there helping the people of Gaza. They're there delivering goods. I mean, if you really do the research, you'll find IDF soldiers grabbing little Palestinian children and holding them and hugging them. They're all, the Hamas is doing the destruction. But look at the propaganda that's, that's being caused. I mean, in here, uh, Chuck Schumer's given a speech on the Senate about how BB needs to go. Butt out, buddy. Butt out. Uh, so don't believe, don't believe the propaganda. And, and, and I think it's, it's, a, it's all a demonic attack. Satan hates Israel because he hates God. He hates Jerusalem because he hates God. He hates the Jewish people because he hates God. He hates us because we love God and support the people and the Temple Mount. One of these days... A temple is going to be built. The Jews are going to take the temple mount. And so you're not going to stop. <laughs> you're not going to stop God's plan. And so just Jesus sees all of this. So he's weeping. He's weeping. He's weeping. Um, let me feel, we're, we're coming close to the end, but I, I want to get to I want to get to the next part. Um, yeah, the people didn't see. The people didn't see. There's so much application there. The world doesn't see Jesus, who he really is. Um, you know, the, so much devastation in people's lives are, are because they fail to see Jesus. What about churchgoers? What about Christians who are failing to see who Jesus really is? Um, Ephesians 1, 17 through 20, you can read that yourself. There's a prayer that Paul prays that God would grant him a spirit of wisdom and revelation to see Jesus, to know Jesus. And, and that's a prayer I've been praying for 20 years. I want to see Jesus. I want spiritual eyes. Uh, so Jesus, let me, let me show you this, because I think you'll like this too as we finish up. Jesus left there. He went down to the southern steps, the entrance to the temple, okay? It says, verse 45, Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people selling animals for sacrifices. He said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Remember, this was, this was a holy week. This is Passover week. There's celebration. The Jews are required to bring their sacrifices. Pull a Siloam. That's where you get cleansed. You walk up that pilgrim's road. You're supposed to bring your sacrifice. It had to be the best. It had to be spotless. Whether if you're a poor, you could bring pigeons, you know, or bulls, goats, whatever. And they would take it up on the to the, the southern steps and take it to be inspected. And then the priest would carry it into the temple. But what was happening, merchants were there. Hey, we got two pigeons, two pigeons, got a bull over here. So there were merchants there selling sacrifices. The whole point is the people were supposed to bring their own sacrifices up the pilgrims. They're supposed to deal with all of the mess and everything. It had to be the best, but you had merchants up there that was selling cheap sacrifices. You know, they're, they were imposter sacrifices, so leftovers, leftovers. So Jesus says, mm -mm, this, is not, this is not the type of sacrifice you're supposed to bring to the Lord. So it, it upset Jesus. Instead of bringing leftovers... Uh, they instead of bringing their best, they were they were buying leftovers. It was a mockery to God. And here are some pictures. Put up this next picture. I got three more pictures. We want these are right along the which side of this would this be the western southwestern side. These are shops, ancient shops, right along right around the corner to the left. And I'll show you is going to be the southern steps. So there's the merchants are going to be there. Buy your lambs for sacrifice right here. Uh, the next picture. 
this is one of the most amazing places in Jerusalem. I actually said, if I was to go to any place in Jerusalem, I want to be here. So much has happened here in Jerusalem. I'll show you later on some other things that happened, but these are the original southern steps going up to Mount Moriah. This is actually the gate. It's a half gate. It's closed in, but this is the original gate that Jesus would have walked through going into the temple. Down here are remains of shops, merchant shops. They're ac actually, they're also baptismal pools, mikvahs. We'll talk about that in another but merchants all down these steps, the bottom, selling, selling these animals. Jesus said, you've, you, you've turned this place. This is supposed to be a house of worship. He's quoting from Isaiah, or no, a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves. The last point, the king of peace, he displays his jealousy over God's house. He's already weeping over the spiritual blindness. He's weeping over the destruction, but now he's furious at their apathy, their spiritual apathy, their lack of reverence for the house of God. I mean, their, their cheap sacrifice. I mean, think about it. In just a few days, he's going to be the sacrifice. He's going to be the perfect sacrifice. So imagine how this hit his heart, that this is, they're profaning God, they're, no fear, no reverence for God, cheap leftovers. And uh, as I close, the question we need to ask ourselves, do we fear God? Do we reverence his house? How our, is our sacrifice, are we bringing God leftovers? Are we bringing him leftovers? Or are we bringing him our best, bringing our best before God? Are we offering selfless sacrificial worship or selfish worship? Are we honoring Christ? Most of all, are we honoring his sacrifice, what Jesus did for us? He's the perfect, he's the perfect lamb of God. Powerful lessons. There's powerful lessons on Palm Sunday. We just see it as the waving in the palm branches, but really, Palm Sunday is really a sobering, should really be sobering. It's not just celebrate. It's these people, they don't get it. <laughs> they the people don't deserve credit. Well, it's like we give people we give them credit for way they don't deserve credit. It's all there weren't they weren't praising him for the right reasons. They failed, they're missing the whole point. They didn't see Jesus for who he really is at the temple, cheap worship. There were literally hundreds of thousands, possibly millions, that would come up these steps. And all these people that are coming in for this holy week for Passover. And they're just they're failing to, to see who Jesus is, where true peace comes from. And so that's Palm Sunday. So that should give us some, um, some reasons to reflect as we come into Palm Sunday, as you read Matthew and as you read Luke. And hopefully you can see these visuals, these images, and see the destruction of Jerusalem, the rocks crying out, why Jesus weeping. And also get a picture of these steps and all the cheap sacrifices there. So that way, when we come to God on Sunday and this play that's going on, you know, and we're sitting in there, we're bringing our best before God. We're, oh, thank you for what you did, what you did for me. You know, so Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday.